Uh, now I open the floor for questions or comments and uh, anybody who wants to speak up using the opportunity of the microphones which are here and the assistants will bring you or you come to the microphone and state your name and institution and uh, please tell the audience which of the panelists you would like to address. So anybody? Yes. We have a gentleman uh, cracking the ice this morning. No, no, we can't hear you. The mic is not on. Now try again, please. There should be a light on the mic so it shows that it's uh, functioning. Um, or should we use the second mic? It's not working? Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> it's not May Day yet, but uh, unless it works, I will give you my ha headset, okay. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm... Rolling. Uh, you see the from the Finnish perm rep in uh, Brussels, I was uh, working with the council conclusions concerning the macro regional strategies. And I have a question. In fact, I have a question to our moderator, is if it's allowed. Yes. So <laughs> once again, in, in this uh, council conclusions, uh, we iterate, reiterated the uh, uh, old slogan, no, New, new funds, no additional structures and no EU legislation. Uh, the, the two parts are clear. We have uh, <coughs> legislation. We will have, uh, let's say, very sophisticated legislation concerning financial instruments. We, uh, uh, EAP director referred to this. So uh, that side is <coughs> going to be okay. We need no. Uh, new structures, we have, uh, let's say, a multitude of structures, institutions in the Baltic Sea region area. And uh, finally, they are starting to cooperate better and better. But what about no new EU funds? Do we <coughs> really have, again, to, <coughs> to uh, stress this slogan, no new funds? Why, Why do we have to? So, so <coughs> of course, we need financing. We need uh, uh, aligning of different financing sources. But uh, do we have to <coughs> say to our, let's say, uh, private partners, sorry, no new funds? What what does this mean? So, I'm asking our moderator <coughs> if you had written this council conclusions, would you have written? This part, uh, I just recall that during the process, the Lithuanian presidency had, had much more <coughs> sophisticated formulations for this this part of the of the document. And but now at the end, we again uh, say this slogan: "No new EU funds." So this is a question for the moderator, of course, for the panelists, of course, all all your or you in the, in the panel. Uh, are we really needing this iteration of, of this no new EU funds? Right. Okay, thank you. That was quite an extended uh, question oh, and comment. And uh, uh, since it has been addressed to me, I will uh, answer it as a person who deals uh, with political science. And uh, uh, perhaps I'm, I'm too often in, in those ivory towers where the scientists used to dwell. But nonetheless, uh, since uh, this venue is uh, to some extent a factory of, of ideas or new ideas that are you know, being built up on, upon each other, uh, that's what we call the synergy of, of, of knowledge uh, or synergy of, of science. So I think that these three no's, uh, where you say no to institutions, no to new um, uh, laws or no to new funding, is uh, taking shape, uh, maybe these three no's uh, remain as those three foundations, but when I think of no new institutions and when I look across 
the networking, uh, PPPs, private-public partnership uh, uh, projects, uh, seed money to develop new projects. So then I say, okay, there are no uh, perhaps uh, coordinating institutions, but ad hoc institutions, ad hoc projects are being born all the time. So that, that sort of changes the concept of, of whether no institutions are being born. They might be informal, but still structures invol involving living people who push for the new project. When it comes to no new laws, then again, I, again, I usually refer to this concept of, of Europeanization. Uh, usually, uh, the member states uh, they upload their concerns, values, interests, fears, uh, experiences on the European agenda. But so can do those uh, institutions. Uh, sometimes on the ad hoc basis, which also can lobby the governments, the private sector, for example, and then on political agenda without new laws, new uh, items appear, and they can be related to the Baltic Sea region. When it comes to funding, I must agree that yes, the new uh, financing uh, period and, and, and the experts and professionals know it much better than I do, but will not earmark uh, money, especially for the Baltic Sea strategy. But uh, de-regionalization perhaps is a new way of uh, having better opportunities to involve the sub-state actors and to let them feel the ownership of the project results, having more opportunities to develop something as hands said, you know, having seed money or writing up a project, solving a, a local or regional issue. And the Baltic Sea strategy, despite those three no's, also helps to reach out for the funding which is already available through, through the national, national um, uh, uh, structures. So that would be very briefly. If anybody else would like to respond to add up, so please go ahead. How do you? Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. we do. Um, I just would like to say something just not to leave the audience with uh, such a negative perception that, that there might not be any funding available in the, in the next 10 years. I think it's, it's to the contrary. There will be massive amounts of funding flowing into the region. There might not be a dedicated additional funding for the purpose of the Baltic Sea regional strategy, but of course all of the countries that are involved in the region are will are we getting substantial amounts of funding? And if you look at the reflection of the previous period, it was not so much the amounts that were the problem, it was the absorption of the funds that could be improved. And that's why a significant amount of efforts have been spent in ensuring that from the project generation side and from the possibility to actually absorb the funds, things improve. And I think there, really is the role for the institutions of the Baltic Sea Regional Strategy uh, that is so important because you are at the basis of project development. You can ensure that new projects are being brought forward, which then will allow the respective authorities that are recipients of the structural funds to actually absorb these funds and that these funds are not having to be returned to the Commission at the end of the period, but they actually can be put to productive use. So I think it's a much more positive story than uh, what maybe came out in the, in the last statement. Okay. See, I told you the money is out there. Don't despair. Okay. Uh, more questions or comments? Who would like to? Yes, gentlemen, the second row, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm, my name is Eric Kiesler from the Swedish Prime Minister's Office. Uh, I was very intrigued by your last words, Mr. Bailund, that uh, you encouraged the policymakers to uh, support the uh, ambitious uh, uh, industries and the environmentally friendly industries, if I understand you correctly. You mentioned, of course, the choice between methanol and, and uh, li liquefied natural gas. Uh, but I would like you to uh, elaborate a little bit more on what you request, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of that message, because I really do think that we should uh, support the, the ambitious and, and uh, uh, 
progressive industry, and this is the industry we want to grow, and, and uh, I realize that we also have a responsibility in this from the policymakers' side. But could you, be, could you, in generic terms, elaborate a little bit more on what you expect? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, it takes two to tango, and uh, I will start with just stating that I think that perhaps our business, uh, the shipping business, has been quite conservative in terms of talking to regulators and policymakers. Uh, somebody said about a year ago that ship owners are very shy and hide uh, somewhere out in the ocean and stay away from everything because they try to be global, international, and don't want to have any regulations going on. Now, that's not a good strategy. So um, we need to be much closer to regulators as uh, shipping communities. And uh, I think that we are starting to see that. And, and we understand that that is important because so many things are happening and need to happen when it comes to development of how we run our shipping business today. And we don't want to leave that enormous responsibility in the lap of the regulators only and the NGOs. We absolutely need to be there and we urge you to invite us more uh, before you make policy decisions. Uh, the strong focus on LNG is a very good example, I think, when the policymakers has not listened to the ship owners. They have listened to the gas providers, they have listened to the ports, and they have listened to the NGOs. But we are the ones taking the cost, and we have not been involved in, in that policymaking. I'm not just blaming the policymakers, I also think it's our own, our own fault, actually. So we all need to be better on this. Uh, and, and I think I have the broader shipping community with me when I'm saying this. So that was really my, my background for that statement. Uh, in, in general terms. Okay, thank you. I also actually have a question, unless anybody minds, so it's to, in two dire needs. I would like to uh, address actually uh, Valentinas Mazuronis and uh, uh, Lisa Melie. Since we speak about the uh, public private partnership, and uh, we know that these so called neo corporatist arrangements where uh, interest groups, uh, farmers, trade unions, employers, and the governments usually cooperate. But is this the only framework how the private sector is included and uh, talked to about the green ideas? Or are there any new arrangements? How do you persuade uh, the private sector to be more green ideas oriented, saying that, well, this is the future, don't be afraid about your competitiveness, it will help? What are solutions? What, what are the convincing ideas, the minister? How, how the private sector reacts? I mean, are, are they reacting? Are they getting involved in this way? Thank you for your questions. It's really, we have all this, uh, not problem, but uh, we must uh, find solution between our ambitions, environment protection ambitions, uh, goals on one hand, and on another hand, uh, uh, our competitiveness and, and, and uh, uh, economic base and so on. And we must try to compromise between these two uh, steps and in this way, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's really uh, very important uh, uh, public sector and private sector must work together and we must understand that environment uh, protection and everything connected with them can be a, a good base for, for business, can be, can, uh, uh, we can have new job, we can have profit from it, and only in this way we can find a, a cooperation with private sector. And only in this way if private sector will see the benefit from uh, these steps, they will work together and we all must work together if we want to reach these uh, uh, level of, 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 of solutions and uh, I see only this way we must find uh, the way which will be accepted at the same time for private sector too and only in this way together with public sector and in cooperation uh, together we can uh, reach our higher uh, environment protection goals and tasks. 
Okay, thank you, Minister. Lisa Melia, and then Hans Brands also want to intervene after. Just, just to comment on your questions and, and the Minister's remarks, I think it's important to, to state that the competitiveness of sustainable business is fully in the competitiveness for the business long term. It's in their own sake, it's in their own um, interest. And I think what Klaus Weilund just mentioned, an example from the shipping industry, is that you need to work together with the policymakers to understand how the future will be shaped by policies but also how the business could fit in your knowledge because you are also the one sitting in the reality and have to both take the cost but also the profit while you adjust to this structure reformal. So I think that's my main point. And then in just terms of general business, sustainable business development, I think we have seen the development when we talk about the CSR, corporate social responsibility movement. You still see this movement from different parts of the world. But in general, from the Nordic perspective, from the Swedish and how we work and frame the CSR, corporate social responsibility, is that it moves from the purely philanthropic sponsorship of business, sponsoring a, a, a school, an education, building a hospital in Africa somewhere. I mean, that's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what we mean when we talk about sustainable business. It's not about using your profit for another purpose, which is a very well purpose. And it's nothing, once again, it's nothing wrong. But it's not what we mean by being competitiveness by sustainability. And then moving to the next phase, uh, compliance, reporting about sustainability. You compliance with the ILO's labor standards. You comply with the environment and multilateral agreement and all the standards in what nation you work at. That's, that's the next phase. And in terms of that, we have seen a tremendous development in terms of reporting requirements. The GRI, the Global Reporting Initiatives, and I mean, there is now a huge movement in business should report. And once again, there's nothing wrong. It could actually drive the sustainability business. But what's really the foundation for reporting is the transparency for the public scrutiny, including NGOs and in media, what is the business actually doing? What are the risk taking in the supply chains and in the business partners that the consumers and buyers may not see at the first scene? But if you're tremendous dependent on water, for example, if a company is dependent on water, it's quite interesting from an investment perspective to know how dependent are you on water and what happens if the scarcity of water just disappears? Your business could be out. And we have seen many examples when that happened. And I, I mean, I'm not going to mention all those examples, but it's quite interesting if you take those up. So it's, that moves from a risk analyze to being profitable. To, and that could happen within one day and your business is gone. So of course it's about profit and survival. And the next phase will be moving into integrated sustainability. So in the business, pure business models, you integrate the purpose of why you actually exist as a company. A company doesn't exist only to make profit. I mean, it makes profit, and that's why it can exist. But you forget sometimes that a company is there to make a service, a product, for the consumers, for somebody in the good cause. So I think we should keep ourselves in mind that we should go back to business. When we're starting the business, it was to support the market with a need. And we change, we find a value for that service and product. And then the whole development have moved up. We have huge multinational, we have hedge funds, we have analytic group who's playing with the money. And, it's, and, and this whole economic crisis failed in trust in the market. And that's also a major part. So I think we have there's so many dimensions when you talk about sustainable business. And now we're seeing another movement, which is the economics of the nature, the natural capital, the natural accounting in terms of value, the nature, value the, eco, the ecosystem services. That's another, another story, and there's another speak for another 20 minutes, so I'm not going to take that. But it's another interesting movement, which gives concrete means to what it actually means to put value on the nature and environmental aspects. Mm -hmm. So I think there's so many dimensions that you need to be aware of, and you also need to wear, where are you as a business in this context? And uh, I it's want to say it, it's, it's very important to begin speak with all groups, including business, in early stages. Business agree, uh, private sector agree, uh, work together, but they want to know exactly about future. They know to, uh, they want to know exactly conditions, framework for the future. And in this case, we can, we can uh, reach results. Yes. About we are speaking now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, good planning is part of good governance. Absolutely. <laughs> Hans? 
I just wanted to, to, to introduce perhaps another point, a perspective in, in our debate. Um, we have uh, Russia around the corner, uh, and uh, uh, to my mind, this is perhaps uh, one of the biggest markets for clean tech solutions, and there will be a huge need for investments uh, over the years. And the Russian government has decided by 2015 even to improve the energy efficiency with 12%. I don't know whether they will succeed in that, but uh, uh, we know from an uh, energy efficiency project that we are leading in Kaliningrad that they are very serious about uh, from, from all levels. They are now starting to invest, um, and I think that uh, I mean uh, that we have in, in our region some of the, the leading uh, countries within clean tech industries, and we have countries that have gone recently through a modernization process and, and earned a lot of experience in how to convert into cleaner solutions. So, uh, I mean, here I just think that we, we should be aware that of the potential uh, in the Russian Federation that we'll be able to, to take that share that, that we ought to take because it is part of our region and it's just around the corner. And I think that the, the more targeted effort uh, could also serve us all uh, well and I think this is also a way of, of getting the private sector on board uh, and knowing what the potential and what the, uh, what the demand is. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I just add one thing? Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I just wanted to make one more point because we tend to forget also business is just not one it's just not one actor. It's yes. so many different kind of businesses. And we may talk about multinational big companies like Stena, for example, that actually have a person that can have the time to sit here and talk about this <laughs> issue. But there is also other smaller companies and startups and innovators that just is so busy to focus on their business model. They, they're not having the time to be involved in government relation discussions and negotiations. And I think it's also important within the business sector to, to also having the links between those different kind of businesses. Okay, uh, okay, one more question, and Ulrika, please. Thank you. My name is Paula Lindros. I come from Baltic University Program, and I would like to, to take up or link to two. Yes. I would like to link to two things that were mentioned here: that the smart cities and the coalition of the willing. And we have been talking very much about the private sector and the public sector, but I would uh, like to take in one more actor, big actor in, in the region, and that's the universities, the higher learning. It's not only the screening of the students bringing up the new generation of decision makers, but please also remember universities are big actors in the cities and the societies they are part of. As, uh, uh, already as organizations, as employers uh, in their cities. They are part of, of uh, a not natural city environment. So they, we are really big actors and could be partners for greening the campuses in, in cooperation with cities, for instance. So not only in research, pure research and education, but universities are also actors within their societies. So I hope that the partnerships will be extended in the smartest way. Thank you. Thank you. And the university is also trendsetters, because that's where the young people get ideas, develop ideas, and perhaps open the new ways of thinking. So all these smart ideas could be, in cooperation, be done in cooperation with students and with researchers. Absolutely, that's what has been said uh, in the second panel yesterday, that you cannot omit science. So now I would like to close the panel by applauding the distinguished, distinguished panelists.